Ted Farrow is probably the most despicable villain I have ever covered on this channel. He is personally responsible for the deaths of billions of people, one of the highest death counts of any villain anywhere. And what is worse is that he killed all those people by accident. It is one thing to slaughter billions of innocent people as part of some evil plan for world domination. It is a very different thing to do it through arrogance, negligence, and short-sightedness. In the former case, you are evil. In in the latter, you are just an idiot. The biggest idiot who ever lived, and that idiot's name is Ted Farrow. He is given the opportunity to redeem himself, but instead he doubles down and makes one of the most frustrating decisions I have ever seen a fictional character make. In a single misguided and rash act, he erases all human knowledge. Horizon Zero Dawn is very much a story about knowledge and technology. It is a story of extremes. On the one hand, knowledge and technology can be our world's salvation. But on the other hand, when misused, they could lead to our annihilation, to untold suffering and anguish. Elizabeth Sobek is meant to represent that good side of technology, the responsible side, the one that wants to use knowledge to create a better world. Ted Farrow represents the extreme opposite. It. Incredible technology that is used irresponsibly, without regard to the safety and well-being of others for profit above all else. In the end, he will blame knowledge itself for the catastrophic destruction his decisions unleashed, failing to recognize that it was his misuse of technology, not the technology itself that was the problem. Ted Farrow is also the first villain I have ever covered on this channel, who never actually appears in the flesh on screen. Usually, in these videos, I watch some cutscenes, and I examine the choices the writers are making in those cutscenes. The dialogue, the behavior, the performance. But we cannot do that this time. So instead, we are going to piece his story together by reading text logs, listening to audio logs, and watching a couple holograms. At the beginning of Horizon Zero Dawn, we are introduced to a world in which primitive tribal humans live amongst the ruins of an extremely advanced but long-lost civilization, and also robot dinosaurs. The most compelling part of this story is the exploration of this mystery. How did the world come to be this way? What happened to humanity's advanced civilization? Why are they living in primitive tribes now? What happened to all that knowledge and technology? What's up with these robot dinosaurs? And Ted Farrow turns out to be the key to all of these questions. The real story begins when our main character, Aloy, arrives at the ancient ruins of the headquarters of a corporation that was destroyed, along with the rest of human civilization, 1,000 years ago. It was called Faro Automated Solutions. Early on, she is given a short biography of the company's founder, who was, of course, Ted Farrow. This is the first information the player is ever given related to his character. So let's read that biography together now. Theodore Ted Farrow, born December 24th, 2013, is an American entrepreneur and business magnate. He is the founder of Farrow Automated Solutions, the largest corporation of all time, the world's wealthiest individual and the first ever trillionaire. Born and raised in Salt Lake City, he enrolled at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he studied business for two years before dropping out in 2033 to start FAS. Though it struggled at first, the company broke through at the end of the troubled 2030s with its popular line of personal servitors and bodyguard bots, then exploded when its famous line of green robots led the race to solve the climate crisis during the 2040s clawback. At the end of that decade, FAS opened a military defense branch, dominating the world market for automated military platforms by 2053. The success of FAS has made Mr. Farrow the world's best-known businessman, one of its most sought-after speakers, and a major voice in politics, culture, and international affairs. Ted Farrow's character is modeled after the archetypical Silicon Valley superstar. He is meant to remind us of people like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, or Elon Musk. 
He dropped out of school to found an innovative technology company, whose success launched him into the stratosphere, becoming the richest man in the world. His story is one we are familiar with. It is worth remembering that Ted Farrow is not himself an engineer. He studied business. He did not design the robots himself, he just created the company who hired the scientists who designed the robots. One of the most interesting parts of Pharaoh's story is that he once used technology to save the world. His company's green robots solved the climate crisis. Of course, what is not mentioned here is that it was Elizabeth Sobek who designed those robots, but still, it was Pharaoh's company she was working for. When he was done acting as the world's savior, he changed course. Instead of saving lives, his company's new robots killed people, and they were really, really good at killing people. It is a dramatic turn that his character never tries to justify. As far as I can tell, all he ever cared about was making money. At the start of his career, the best way to make money was to develop green robots. And when that was over, the best money was in private military contracts, so that's where he went. As we explore the ruins of his company, we can find several audio and text logs, which describe the beginnings of the disaster that destroyed human civilization. We are going to listen to the first one now. Here it is. Now, I know this must seem like a bizarre change in direction. I mean, we're Faro Automated Solutions, right? Number one robotics firm in the world. Why would we clear our production slate to fabricate human-operated vehicles and weapon systems, the relics of the past? All I can say at this juncture is... Trust me. We will be exploiting a massive... Uh, growth opportunity by retooling and reallocating capacity according to my plan. So I will need revised projections of mass fabrication velocity across every pipeline within 36 hours. This is the first time we ever hear Ted Farrow's voice. And let's talk about that voice. His voice actor consistently delivers his lines in this nervous, anxious, agitated sort of way. He never sounds really sure of himself, really confident. Of course, this is because Ted has made an extraordinary mistake, the mother of all mistakes. And the consequences have already begun to totally shatter his psyche. He has no confidence in himself anymore. There is a weight hanging around his neck that he can never get rid of, and you can hear that in his voice. But let's look at the content of the log itself. Pharaoh is announcing a dramatic and immediate change in his company's focus. His company makes robots, that's all they ever did, it was a robotics company. And then, all of a sudden, without any warning at all, basically overnight, they ceased all robotic production and switched over to producing human-operated weapons. That is pretty crazy. Try to imagine that you are someone who works at this company. The CEO makes this announcement. How would you react? You would be so confused, so baffled, so uncertain, and probably very nervous. You would suspect that something somewhere has gone very, very wrong. And I must say that I love the way the writers present this mystery to the player, little piece by little piece. The first time I played this game, I could not stop going. This was one of those games where I was really excited to find each new text or audio log, to uncover another small part of that mystery. Anyway, in the next audio log, we are going to learn what happened. The protocols use polyphasic entangled waveforms, quantum encryption, black quartz stuff, way beyond military grade. That's what you demanded. So that's what we delivered. You don't code something you can't crack. All we need is a backdoor. Upload the latest service pack update and the problem goes away. You specifically forbade us from leaving anything resembling a backdoor in code. Every protocol to black quartz standard. Your words. Look. If you need me to fudge some projections, it's nothing we haven't done before. I don't need fudged projections. I need a way to reassert control over the Hearts team or swarm. I don't know what to tell you, Ted. You're asking the impossible. This is the exact moment when Pharaoh realized that he had made a colossal mistake, that he had lost total control of the situation, that there was nothing he could do to solve it. And more than that, it was all his fault. It was his orders that created this situation. They have lost control over something called the Hearts Timor Swarm. 
Okay, so the Hearts Timor Energy Combine is a fictional corporation operating out of the island of Timor. The Hearts Timor Energy Combine purchased military robots from Faro Automated Solutions for unspecified security purposes. Those robots have experienced an unexpected glitch and are no longer accepting commands from anyone. They are operating totally independently, and because of Ted's decision to build them with the most advanced encryption known to man, they can cannot be hacked or stopped. A bunch of killer robots are on the loose and nobody knows how to stop them. Now let's take a closer look at the robots themselves. The Hearts Timor Swarm is made up of what Pharaoh called the Chariot Line of Peacekeeper Machines, the most advanced combat automatons ever produced. The chariot line consisted of three robo-models. The small scout model, which are capable of hacking virtually any automated system they encounter, meaning you cannot fight them with other robots, they'll just turn your own robots against you. Then there's the medium weapons platform model, which is a walking death machine covered in layers of rocket launchers and machine guns. And finally, the colossal queen model, which was capable of self-replicating, meaning that, given enough time and enough resources, resources, it could manufacture an infinite number of new combat robots. All of these machines can run on biofuel, meaning they can keep fighting and self-replicating as long as they have access to new biomass, which includes literally anything organic. Forests, animals, even humans. All of that sounds pretty bad. And it is meant to reveal an incredible hubris in Ted Farrow's character. He personally engineered the creation of an unstoppable swarm of killer machines. He is the architect of the greatest threat on life Earth has ever faced. It's like that classic line in Jurassic Park. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they did not stop to think if they should. In some ways, Horizon Zero Dawn follows the exact same plotline as Jurassic Park, just at a much, much larger scale. In their arrogance and short-sightedness, scientists have created something that they cannot control, and now it is going to eat them. They are literally devoured by their own irresponsible use of knowledge and technology. Alright, so what was this Hearts Timor Swarm? doing with its newfound independence? Well, let's look at two text logs to find out. Here's the first. Another problem to add to our big steaming pile, apparently a fisherman in the Bonda Sea captured a video of a Hearts Timor Horus unit refueling via biomatter conversion along the shoreline of Pula Watar on a pod of endangered dolphins, no less, quite possibly the last of their kind. Not to get graphic, but it looks like what happens inside a blender, as if the robot was whipping up a big pink swirling milkshake of dolphin chum. Our suppression team has scrubbed it from 43 networks, but it's still propagating, so it's only a matter of time before it goes viral. A prepared statement feels grossly insufficient. Any suggestions? This one's a real stinker. All right, and here is the second. Ever hear of the Melville Island Fruit Association? Neither had I until they filed suit against us this morning. Apparently, there's a little island paradise off the coast of Australia, population 2700, all of whom hate us. Now that a stray Hearts Timor unit is chowing down on their largest mango orchard, that brings the official count of Hearts Timor related lawsuits to 127, most of them from private companies, but also a bunch from individuals, nation states, and NGOs. And that's not even counting the mother of all liability claims from Hearts itself. Call every external firm we've ever used, then call their competitors too. We're going to need every corporate defense lawyer we can find who's still half sober and on the bar. From these two logs, we learn that the Hearts Timor Swarm disaster, what will eventually be called the Pharaoh Plague, began at a very small scale. The robots ate some mango trees, ate a couple dolphins. Unfortunate, but not a big deal, really. Something that can be settled with a couple lawsuits. But at this point in the story, everyone is already dead. And I mean everyone. Every single living thing on Earth. Every person, every animal, every plant, every amoeba is already doomed. Extinction and annihilation have begun. That fisherman filmed a viral video of the beginning of the end of the world. It starts small, a tree here, a dolphin there. 
These are converted into biofuel, and that biofuel is used to produce another combat robot, which goes out and eats a few more trees and a few more dolphins to produce a few more combat robots, and so on and so forth. The rate of expansion is exponential and unstoppable. This week, we lose one island. Next month, we lose an entire country. Next year, the world is gone, and no one realizes it yet. Everyone is still just living their lives normally with no conception of the tragedy that is unfolding right underneath their feet. They are dealing with it business as usual, hire some lawyers, file some lawsuits, run a bit of PR damage control. The only person in the world who realizes just how bad the situation actually is, is Ted Farrow, the guy who caused it. All life on Earth will be extinct in less than two years, and he has no idea what to do about it. So he calls someone who he hopes will know what to do, Elizabeth Sobeck, the genius engineer who designed the green robots that solved the climate crisis. At the very top of this tower, Aloy can find a couple hologram recordings of their meeting. We are going to watch two of them back to back. Here they are. This isn't a glitch. It's a catastrophe. Fully aware. It's bad. Bad? Jesus, Liz. It's not bad, Ted. It's apocalyptic. You built a line of killer robots. Peacekeepers that consume biomass as fuel in emergencies and you made them capable of self-replication limited self-manufacture controlled not anymore the glitch severed chain of command the only nation this swarm answers to now is itself you, you think I did? everything else is just food and at the rate it's replicating ted it will strip the earth bare in 15 months we're not talking the fall of civilization we're talking extinction i get it liz so how do I stop it while it's contained? It's not contained! It can't be! You know what I mean! Right. Before the truth gets out, you mean. Liz, I will do anything you say. Keep working it, and whatever you recommend, I'll do. I'm gonna hold you to that, Ted. Project Zero Dawn. Jesus, Liz. There has to be another way. If there are a nicer way to fix your mess, I would have proposed it. But this? This? When I asked you to find a cure, I didn't expect it to be worse than the disease. It's not, Ted. It may be grim, but it's our only chance. Now sign the proposal. Sign it? I can't sign that. Yes, you can. That? Liz, I cannot in good conscience sign that. You've got a choice, Ted. I know. I'm speaking to you from a VTOL en route to U.S. Robot Command. In 15 minutes, I meet with General Harris and the rest of the Joint Chiefs. What? what? Are you crazy? Now your choice is what I tell them. Sign, and I'll tell them the wealthiest corporation on Earth has guaranteed the funds necessary to build Zero Dawn. Exactly as I've designed it. Or don't sign, and I will make sure they and everyone else on this planet knows the real cause of the glitch. Jesus, Liz. You don't have to threaten me. I'll sign. Look on the bright side, Ted. From here on out, you get to do what you've always been good at. Footing the bill while others get their hands dirty. This is the first time we see a visual representation of Ted Farrow, but there's not anything really significant about his visual design. He is visually unassuming. He looks like any other middle-aged man because, in this story, it was ordinary people driven by ordinary greedy ambitions that destroyed the world. In the first hologram, Farrow is portrayed as utterly pathetic, throwing up weak excuse after weak excuse that Sobek easily tosses aside. Essentially, he is a man on his knees, begging his enemy, and they are enemies. In a hologram we did not watch, it is revealed that Ted had filed 
15 retaliatory lawsuits against Sobek and her own robotics corporation. Anyway, he is on his hands and knees begging his enemy to clean up his mess for him. It is fascinating that in the second hologram, he talks about what he can and cannot do in good conscience. Apparently, this good conscience was nowhere to be found when he was approving the designs for the deadliest combat automatons ever conceived. And this moral defense does not last long this time either. After a meager protest, he almost immediately gives in. Ted Farrow is a character with virtually no redeeming qualities. Not only is he responsible for the deaths of billions, but he is so pitiful in person too. In my previous video, I discussed how I found Far Zenith to be far less impressive than other villains, because of their lack of ambition or vision, the way they waste their gifts. Well, Ted Farrow is even less impressive than them. He is presented as this bumbling, senseless character who accidentally stumbles, trips, and falls face first into the apocalypse. However, despite all that, he is offered some small redemption here. He will provide the money and resources necessary to create Zero Dawn, the desperate plan which will save the world. That could have been the end of his story. He paid the check for salvation and then disappeared into the back pages of history. A reviled man whose money both destroyed and then saved the world. But of course, his story does not end there. Next, Aloy journeys to a place called the Grave Horde, the site of an ancient battle between men and machines, a place littered with the corpses of long-dead soldiers and the looming hulk of a deactivated colossal Horus Titan. The Grave Horde is made up of the ruins of the headquarters of United States Robot Command, really the HQ of the entire American military, an underground complex where the American army made its last stand, and where they were utterly slaughtered, killed to the last man. There was not a single survivor. Once again, we find a collection of audio and text logs which tell their story, including several audio logs in which you can hear the sounds of this final battle. I'm not actually going to play any of these, but I do want to show you the game's description for this one. It says, Sounds of metal rupturing, desperate battle, screaming. There is a single shouted name and then silence. That is how the United States Army meets its end, a single final scream and then nothing. At the very beginning of the game, as a child, Aloy stumbles into an ancient bunker, and there she finds the mummified corpses of a dozen or so people, all of whom had taken their own lives. You can actually listen to their final words, all of which are aching and desperate and mournful. People who have given up, people who have no other choice left. Something that is important to understand about the Pharaoh Plague is that it killed violently, very violently. Every single person on the planet had a choice to make. They could either be killed by the machines, which would mean being shot, stabbed, burned, torn, crushed, death by bullets, by fire, by having their bodies torn apart, a death in pain and anguish and terror, or they could kill themselves. Those were the only two choices available to every single human on Earth. Death by machine or death by self. Horizon Zero Dawn is, at times, among the most depressing games I have ever played. And in this story, there is one single man who is responsible for every single one of those deaths. For every ounce of that pain and anguish and terror. And his name is Ted Farrow. But it gets even worse. In the Grave Horde, we can also listen to older audio logs left behind by the soldiers, months before the final battle, before they knew they were truly doomed, when they still had hope that they could either stop the swarms themselves or buy enough time for Zero Dawn to save them all. And as you listen to these logs, after the soldiers experienced defeat after defeat, as the swarm just kept spreading, as the battles destroyed more and more of the world, as as cities were turned to ash, as civilians were slaughtered by the millions, as the biosphere itself collapsed, as the air ceased to be breathable, you can hear the hope in their voices dwindle away into nothing. We are going to listen to two of these. Here is the first. Log. Third Battle of California Marine. The swarm came in from the Pacific, and I don't know if it was the local Minutemen or the crazy 15th, but... They'd set the garbage patch alight. 
Man, the sea was on fire. That stuff was... <sighs> the first wave of bots came in covered in burning sludge. It bought us an hour or two of slaughtering them on the beaches before the swarm recalculated. We pulled them inland, back to the Kalmar sprawl. Dropped buildings on them, EMP'd the grid. Standard operating procedure. <sighs> the last time I was in California, I was... Five, six? The light was like that vintage social net filter that was everywhere in the 40s. This log gives a sense of the scale of the fighting. These were battles against vast hordes of machines, in which the defenders purposely wrecked critical infrastructure to slow down their attackers, dropped entire cities on top of them, lit the very ocean on fire. That first log describes the swarm's first landfall in America, and it was a truly epic struggle, one of the grandest battles ever fought in the history of this planet, the destruction of an entire continental coastline. It is important to remember that the Pharaoh Plague lasted for months, 15 months to be exact. 15 months of fighting hopeless battles in which truly no sacrifice was too great because everything was going to die anyway. 15 months of fighting without rest, without pause, without time to mourn the fallen, without time to do anything but get ready for the next battle, all for the sake of giving Zero Dawn one more day, one more hour, one more minute to complete their project. But Zero Dawn would not save them. It turns out that Zero Dawn was not intended to save a single life. Its purpose was to use a mixture of advanced artificial intelligence, robotics, and terraforming systems to eventually rebuild and repopulate the Earth's biosphere. Hundreds of years in the future, long after all these people had been killed by the Pharaoh Plague. There is no salvation in this story. Not for these soldiers, no safety anywhere. Only death and suffering. Horizon Zero Dawn's backstory is so vast in the scale of its tragedy. The first time I played this game, I had never seen anything like it before. Alright, here is the second audio log. Ames, I don't even know if you're alive anymore. The mails I get from you, they say they're from you, but they don't sound... They sound recycled. Phrases put together, and you don't say anything about the news I pass on. The containment zone, the rebreathers, the rioting, one earth. What happened in the Dallas bubble, Ames? That wasn't the robots. They won't even give me a straight answer when I demand to know if you're still alive. They just say if your messages keep coming, then you're still operational. It's not fair, Ames. It's not fair that you won't be with me when the lights go out. I love you. This is one of the only logs in the game that gives us any sense of a civilian's perspective on these events. What it was like to be just a normal person in these extraordinary times. And you can hear in this person's voice the uncertainty, the anxiety, the fear, the hopelessness which must have been typical in those last months. The final months on Earth would have been chaos, masses of refugees being moved from one containment zone to another, again and again, running away from the spreading swarm until they had nowhere left to run to. And then they were slaughtered where they stood, en masse, by cold, unfeeling machines. Those people would have been terrified, they would have been angry. We hear about violence in one of the containment zones that was not caused by the machines, but by humans. These were scared people living in the end times, whose lives were being uprooted, whose world was coming undone all around them, who probably did not really understand what was happening or why. These last months would have been miserable and painful and terrifying. The purpose of these logs is to give the audience a sense of the human tragedy here, to give us a human perspective, a single voice we can latch on to, a single character we can empathize with, through whom we can understand the personal, emotional experience of these events. And it all comes back to Ted Farrow. None of this would have happened if not for his decisions. He is the single source of all that pain. And unlike a lot of the villains I have covered on this channel in the past, Ted Farrow is not evil. He does not want to cause pain. 
he is just a regular guy who made some of the dumbest possible decisions. When he realizes what he has done, the scale of the tragedy he created, sees his world destroyed, I think he suffers from some sort of a psychological breakdown. He desperately searches for a way to redeem himself, to become a savior instead of the villain. And that desperation leads him to make a terrible choice, which we will see in the next section of the game. Eventually, Aloy reaches the ruins of Gaia Prime, the central hub from which the AI was supposed to manage the terraforming system. It has been destroyed, but that is a topic for another video. All that matters for now is that this is the location of Ted Farrow's final mistake. To understand that mistake, we are going to listen to two audio logs and watch one hologram back to back. Here they all are. What are we going to plug into their heads, Les? A whole lot of history? A whole lot of so-called truth? A whole lot of noise? It's not pablum, Les. It's poison. I've, I've been taking a hard look at the project. In the end, it's simple. It's clean. It's clear. Erasure. Addition by subtraction. I can make it better, Liz. With a single stroke, make it all go away. I'm locked out of core control. Alpha clearance overridden. What the hell is Omega clearance? Oh, no. Alpha personnel. Sorry to alarm you, but I need you to listen, okay? To what I'm about to say. This isn't easy. See, uh, I've, um, uh, please, stop trying to access the system, okay? See, see, what this is about is, um, I said stop trying to access the goddamn system. And what, what I'm trying to say is I can't stop thinking about the ones who come after us. Those innocents, those blameless men, and, 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 and women. We're gonna give them knowledge? Like it's a gift? Ted, Ted, we've talked about this before. Apollo has 3,000 plus failsafe conditions. It's not a gift, it's a disease. They're the cure, and we're gonna give them the disease. Our disease? No, we can't. And it's not too late. If we're willing to Ted, sacrifice. it doesn't need to be like this. It already is, Samina. I did it three minutes ago. I've purged Apollo. It's gone. All of it. Every copy. A sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's cultural obliteration, you crazy bastard. Millennia of culture. I'm sorry. Really, I am. But sometimes, to protect innocence, innocents have to die. Emergency alert. There is a lot to discuss here. Let's start with the murder of all those people. These are the scientists who created Zero Dawn, the people who saved the world, humanity's brightest and best minds, and Ted Farrow kills all of them with a single stroke. I talked before about how Pharaoh destroyed the world completely by accident. He killed billions of people through negligence and myopia. This is different. This was on purpose. This was cold, calculated, and planned. This is murder. This is the moment when Ted Pharaoh becomes a true villain. Before, he was just a bumbling doofus. Now, he is a killer. But he does not just kill people with this decision. He kills entire cultures. He kills all culture everywhere. All human knowledge erased in an instant. He believes he is doing the right thing. It was knowledge and technology that allowed a person like him, an arrogant buffoon, to destroy the entire world. If he did not have the technology, he could not have done that, right? It's not his fault, it's the technology's fault. Of course, this ignores the obvious counterpoint, that it was also technology that saved the world. The problem is not the technology, the problem is Ted Farrow and people like him. 
it is also a completely impotent act because it is not actually possible to destroy knowledge. Even if we lost everything today, all of our scientific progress, all of our collective knowledge, as long as intelligent and curious beings exist somewhere, it will all be found again. Scientific theories and mathematical formulas will always be rediscovered eventually. You can stunt curiosity, you can put up as many roadblocks as you want, but you cannot stop it entirely. I honestly believe that even the cultural knowledge would eventually be restored in some form or another. Whatever truth can be found in the arts, in our poetry, in our painting, in our philosophy, that will be rediscovered too. Sure, the individual poems would be gone, but whatever truth is within them is not dependent on the actual poem itself. New poets will come, and their new works will contain old truths. So, in the end, Pharaoh's final decision is just pointless. It is useless. And of course, even if he could permanently destroy knowledge, it would not turn humans into perfectly moral and ethical creatures. Cavemen are just as likely to lie and steal and murder as anyone living in the modern day. Maybe even a little more so. Maybe all these centuries of moralizing and philosophizing and lawmaking have made us a tiny bit less likely to lie and steal and murder. And then again, maybe not. Either way, Ted Farrow is a useless idiot. Through this act of erasure, he's also sort of destroying the world a second time. With his robots, he killed everyone. And now, by erasing this collection of human knowledge, he is killing all of those people's memories, too. Any record that they ever existed. Their accomplishments, their creation, their voices, their personal tragedies, all lost forever. Of course, he also gets to erase any record of his own mistakes, too. Maybe, through this act of erasure, he thought that no one would ever know what he had done. He would not be remembered as the reviled architect of the apocalypse that he deserved to be remembered as. This may have been a purely selfish choice. Whatever his true motivations, that is the end of his story in Horizon Zero Dawn. At the end of the first game, his ultimate fate was one of the few unanswered mysteries. What happened to Ted Farrow? Did he just go off and die of natural causes? We know that he built a bunker called Thebes for himself, that he filled it up with go-go girls and ludite zealots, but we do not know the fate of that bunker until the sequel, Horizon Forbidden West. In that game, Aloy, along with a tribe called the Quen, discovers the location of his bunker. The Quen are a tribe who worship the ancestors, and particularly Ted Farrow, who they believe was responsible for saving the world. The leader of their expedition here calls himself a CEO, a fun misunderstanding of the term CEO, and he believes himself to be a reincarnation of Ted Farrow. And in this role, he is arrogant, abusive, and short-sighted, and so Ted Farrow's legacy lives on in a twisted and unexpected way. Thebes is modeled after an Egyptian pyramid. Of course, Ted's surname, Pharaoh, was always supposed to be an allusion to the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, though now the writers are taking that allusion to a pretty extreme level. To be honest, I think they're laying it on pretty thick here, especially the giant statue to himself in the center of the bunker. This is all a bit over the top. I would have preferred Ted's egomania to be portrayed in a more subtle way, but whatever. In this bunker, we do learn the ultimate fate of ultimate loser Ted Farrow. After the end of the world, he locked himself in here with a bunch of giggling playboy bunnies, a spiritual guru, and a brilliant doctor. Before sealing the doors, Ted had the doctor implant each of the survivors with a biological kill switch. If any of them ever became a problem, or if he ever lost control of the situation, he could regain control with the press of a button. He could kill anyone whenever he wanted. He also rigged the bunker's thermal generator to explode if he ever died, so no one could ever retaliate against him. Unsurprisingly, he quickly began abusing this power. First, he killed the spiritual guru who had discovered that Ted murdered the Zero Dawn scientists. 
and then Ted started killing anyone who asked questions, until there was no one left but the doctor and the doctor's teenage daughter. This doctor had been performing innovative but imperfect life-extensive operations on Pharaoh. These kept him alive but mutated parts of his body. For a while, the doctor was able to correct these mutations. But then, finally, he and his daughter chose death rather than to continue living under the thumb of a mad king. And let's listen to an audio log to hear Ted's response. Saw so dead, along with his kid. Found him on the floor of his office this morning, holding hands. Must have poisoned themselves. I never would have put them to sleep. She was just a girl, for Christ's sake. I offered them life. And this is how they repaid me, by leaving me all alone. But I guess I've been alone since this whole thing began. Alone in bearing the burden for the past, for the future. Same old Ted. No matter who dies, he's the one feeling sorry for himself. Less his future. Less his children. Someday they'll come, and I'll be here to greet them. Sometimes that my aging has stopped altogether. If anything, my cells are replenishing faster than normal. I just need some time for the mutations to calm down. Time. And energy. Sometimes that the reactor can give me what I need. To grow strong again. To get my shit back together. So I can greet the kids. They're gonna need me. My advice. My guidance. And then I won't be alone anymore. In the end, Ted Farrow continued to cling to this vision of himself as humanity's savior, because he could not face the fact of his own mistakes, all the destruction those mistakes had caused. It was easier to live in his imagination than deal with the truth. In the sequel, the writers have really turned up the dial on Farrow's megalomania and villainy. In the original, he was an arrogant jerk, but he was never this insane, never quite this murderous. I suppose you could explain this change in character by saying that his psychological state continued to deteriorate after the murder of the Zero Dawn scientists, that the overwhelming guilt finally broke his mind, that he became insane, obsessed with himself, obsessed with this fiction in which he could redeem himself by serving as a reborn human civilization's immortal shepherd. Luckily for humanity, that never happened. He remained locked up here. Ted Farrow has been alive and alone for a thousand years, his body constantly mutating, evolving, changing, feeding off the bunker's geothermal power plant. He is still alive when Aloy arrives, but he has transformed into something utterly inhuman. His outward appearance has transformed to match the hideous sins he has committed. We never actually see him on screen, but in this cutscene, we do get to hear him and see a sort of visual representation of how his flesh has spread throughout the geothermal power plant. So let's watch just a little of that together. Trust me. You don't want to go in there. Are you mad? I haven't come all this way to stop now. At last, Pharaoh's legacy is mine. Burn it to ash. Wait, no. Pharaoh has it rigged to melt down if- Kill them too. No witnesses. 
This is how Ted Farrow finally dies. These people, members of the Quen tribe who worship his memory, discover his present self, this monstrous and revolting mutated physical body. He appears to be incapable of speech. He can only scream as he dies. He is allowed no last words. Farrow's fate is a bit over the top. Subtlety is not Horizon's forte, but this is all thematically appropriate. This is the guy who killed billions of people on accident and then just kept making worse and worse decisions afterwards. He does deserve to be transformed into a monster. He does deserve a thousand years of loneliness and painful mutation. Considering the scale of his mistakes, if he had been allowed to just die peacefully in his bed, I think that would have been narratively disappointing. He deserves a fate as foul and as horrific and as torturous as what he did to the people of the world. And that is what the writers give us. For me, Ted Farrow has remained a very memorable villain, even years after the original game's release. A character who destroyed the world by accident and then sort of saved it by accident too. And then, in his desperate search for redemption, he makes an even bigger mistake. By trying to do the right thing, he instead did the absolute worst possible thing. And then in the sequel, this descent into insanity and violence. The dramatic physical mutations to transform him into the monster he always truly was. To literally turn him inside out, expose his hideous core to the world. It is a compelling story, even more so because it is a story that happens entirely in the past, that we only learn through logs and holograms without him ever appearing on screen. As I mentioned before, Horizon is a story of extremes. Through Elizabeth Sobek and Aloy and their friends and allies, we are shown all these incredible things that humanity is capable of. Ted Farrow is the opposite. He represents the worst of humanity. The arrogance, the greed, the short-sightedness, the way he never ever learns from his mistakes, the way he just keeps making the wrong choices, even when he is surrounded by so many better examples, when he has so many chances to be better. That is why Ted Farrow is one of the most despicable villains in the history of video games. 